Thank you. This is uh, meeting 18 in a little over a month, which means that uh, we've been home two nights in three weeks. And I'm proud to tell you that that is the key for every successful marriage. <laughs> anyway, thank you all very much for, the, for, your, uh, for your warm welcome. Look, I've got a routine that I go through pretty well every morning. One of the first things I do is I always Google Kevin O'Leary from the Lang O'Leary Show to hear what he's saying. Did you get that out here, the Lang O'Leary Show? Oh, what a beauty. Anyway, what did he say a week and a half ago? Three and a half billion people living in poverty is fantastic news. Who would say that? Like, how could that even enter your mind that one person living in poverty the negative impact it has on the family, the kids, all of the negativity that goes along with it. And somebody would say that three and a half billion people in poverty is fantastic news. And the reason we're doing this tour is there's far too many people out there that actually believe that. There's a lot of people out there that actually believe that you need a level of poverty, you need low wages in order to lower expectations for working class people. So that mindset truly has to be challenged and it has to be defeated. So after I get my day started by Googling Kevin O'Leary, then I go for my morning laugh, so I Google the Toronto Mayor Rob Ford to find out what he's been doing. And you know, so then I laugh because I know he's so tightly connected with the right. Do you remember when he was popular, there'd be pictures of him and Stephen Harper with the fishing gear and Tim Hudak, and they'd be traveling around, great friends. Now all of a sudden, they, boy, you want to talk about abandoning ship. You don't see Hudak, you don't see Harper, you don't see anybody with them. And this morning, the Canadian dollar is sitting at around 90 cents. And I do that because we are an export nation, and if you want to talk about a key to stimulating the economy here in Canada, very much of it, especially in the manufacturing sector, starts with a low Canadian dollar. So all of the, oh, how the unions are the job killers and how we're bad for the economy, look what's happened the last six months now that the dollar's gone from par to 90 cents. All of a sudden, the manufacturing sector, to a large extent, is stabilized. The auto sector is stabilized, a lot of the auto parts. But some of the key manufacturing sectors in Canada, including shipbuilding, some of the other sectors that are so important, have all of a sudden have now not only stabilized, but are starting to pick up. So the debate on how to create great jobs in Canada ought not to be a difficult one, but it is. So why are we here? This is our Rights at Work campaign because this is absolutely so important for each and every one of us. I'd first of all like to start off by thanking our two community speakers. Fred, I'd like to thank you for your comments. We've got your comments on film. So when I'm in Bella Lion Bargain, if you piss me off, I'll show you that film. I'm not kidding. Anyway, this is so important. Unifor was born less than six months ago to challenge. People like Dave Coles, Ken Luenzas, the leaders of our respective organizations knew that things had to change and things had to change rapidly. And they understood that working class people were being pushed around from coast to coast to coast. They understood that the people that caused the economic recession of 2008, 2009, that really drove us into the worst recession in 65 years, those people that made those mistakes six, seven years ago are so confident today and are making even bigger mistakes today. And with that confidence comes an attack on us. So in order for us to be able to fight, in order for us to be able to challenge, they thought Putting together a larger organization with a stronger voice was critical. And so that's what has been created. Because brothers and sisters, it's not good enough, frankly, for us just to be bigger. Because bigger doesn't always mean that you're better. But bigger in this circumstance unites the 20 of the key, most important sectors of the economy around Canada. So with being bigger, we have much bigger responsibility. And that's what this is about. So this is about us challenging, and this is about us leading. So we've restructured our organization. We're going to do a lot more restructuring, but we've made some important changes right off the bat. 
Because in order to be a true national union with a national voice from coast to coast to coast, we can't do that with a communications department based out of Toronto. So what are one of the first things we did? We put a person in the communication department out on the west coast, and you've been introduced to Shelley, our new communications person here on the east coast. Welcome to Unifor, and you've got a heck of a lot of work to do, young um, Shelley. <laughs> so anyway, so we put together a communications department because it's so important that we deal with our issues in our respective provinces immediately. We brought on Jordan, a new economist, a young economist, because our loved Jim Stanford won't be with us forever. So we've got to make sure, we've got to make sure that we're prepared not only for today, not only for tomorrow, but for the long term. So we're bringing a lot of young, talented people on staff to make sure that Unifor is one strong organization for years and years to come. But above all, we're doing what we committed to do less than six months ago, and that's get out there in front and make sure that our issues are heard. And we are out there, and boy are we out there. Would you mind taking off that Montreal Canadiens hat? It's really disturbing me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm only kidding. Anyway, oh. <laughs> anyway, so what did we do? We, we created, we call it our strategic planning committee. And this committee is very important. As a top leadership of the union, we get together every six weeks. And we talk about the important issues, not only to our union, but to working class people in general. And so what are some of the issues that we highlighted right off the bat? We meet every six weeks, by the way. Not six weeks and then maybe it slides to seven weeks. No, 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 no. Every six weeks to the day we meet. Why? Because with an organization this size, we are in so much collective bargaining, there are so many issues that it's easy to get distracted from some of the real huge, huge issues that are so important uh, to everyone in Canada. Collective bargaining is critical, it's the foundation of our union, but we have 3,000 collective agreements in our union. So I understood as an assistant, and I understand clearly as an assistant, the roles and how busy the organization would be. Collective bargaining, troubles, problems, strikes, potential strikes, issues, workplace closures, the challenges that deal with us every day. So we meet every six weeks to make sure that we don't lose track of some of the key issues. Number one, and what's the biggest issue that we are dealing with? The frustration of young people, the frustration of our members because of the insecurity of the workplaces. And I think about it. And I think about how many of our members have lost their jobs as a result of the recession and have had absolutely no fault of their own. But if you listen to the right, you would think somehow that working class people is what caused the problems in Canada when we were the innocent byproduct of lousy policies. So we're out there now saying as a union, you know what we're going to do? We're going to host a good job summit. We're going to hold it in October. And though the finale may be in Toronto, we're going to have different events across the country. Why? Because young people need to know there's a better way to do things. And not only young people, but our members in their 40s and their 50s and their 60s that lost their jobs that still need to work. So we need to talk about real solutions for putting people to work. Because think about it and think about some of the numbers and think about some of the comments of the previous speakers. Young people today have been totally betrayed. And they're furious about it. Think about it, and we all did it. I've got four kids from 21 to 29. Four of them. And we said this to all of our kids. Some took it, but some did listen, some didn't listen. But we said, go to school. Get your education. Get your diploma, get your degree, and your job will be waiting for you. Right? That's what we told them, right? So here they are, 60, 70, 80, $90,000 debts, and they got no jobs. And they're working two jobs, and they're working three jobs, and they're really frustrated. And you know, I say this, and I don't mean it in a joking manner, and it may come out that way, but here's one of the frustrations. Young people, 22, 23 years old, and they should be having their good job, they should be building their family, they should be stable, and what ends up happening? They move back home, right? And then they bring, somebody, bring a partner with them. And then sometimes they bring kids. And here are your empty nesters, instead of two of you, there's like six. But it's not funny. No, I know it's true what happened to me. It's not funny. 
It's not funny at all. But that's what's going on. And it's not funny because there's no reason for it. And it shouldn't be happening at a time in a country where we are generating the most wealth we ever had in our history. So young people today aren't putting up with it, and I'm encouraged by it. I'm convinced that the Charest government in Quebec was defeated because of the student movement. No question about it. Young people banded together to say, you know what, this is absolutely wrong. And they argued and they fought and they demonstrated and there's no question, people are listening. And the, the other part about the frustration with the kids and the fact that the kids are moving back home. By so you know, it used to be about 20%, 21% about 10 years ago of kids 21 that were still at home. Today it's at about 40 to 43%. So that tells you a lot. So the parents today that bought this whole argument about globalization, about free market, about letting the business community do what they want, eliminate all the tariffs, eliminate all the barriers, create an environment for the business that somehow that was going to create all the jobs. Well, you know what? The parents today are sitting back feeling somewhat foolish because the ideology that they believed in for so many years has betrayed their own children. So times are changing, brothers and sisters. Times are changing. So one of the things we're doing as an organization and we're doing as a new union is we are making sure that we will use every opportunity in collective bargaining in a major sector to talk about a vision for Canada. And let me give you an example. We just kicked off bargaining with the forestry sector, the pulp and paper group. And think about it, the forestry sector, about 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, we used to have over 400,000 people working in the sector. Today, there's 230,000. Think about Canada, a land that is so rich with natural resources, raw materials, the forestry is beautiful. Why can't that be a key staple as we prepare an economy for generations to come? Why shouldn't we have a strategy to make sure that that becomes a key piece of our sector? Think about the communities that have been devastated, completely wiped out. And there's not a rhyme or reason for it at all because when you're pushed to find solutions, it's fascinating how you can find solutions. In 2008, when the market collapsed, and I want to remind everybody why the market collapsed. Do we remember? The banking industry, the subprime mortgages, the ninja loans, Lehman Brothers. So when the banking system collapsed, they brought everything down with them. So people were scrambling. Governments around the world were scrambling to find solutions. And in the United States, they recognized that the forestry sector was important. And they put into place, they called it the black liquor credits. And what it was was a mechanism that the government put in to bolster the forestry sector, and what it did is it stabilized it. And it was only after we demonstrated in mass in Ottawa did our government do something comparable to stabilize the forestry sector here in Canada. It would have been completely wiped out. So what ended up happening with that type of assistance? 98 projects across the country and it stabilized the system. But I don't call 230,000 jobs from 400,000 jobs stable. I consider it, we need, I consider it time for the dialogue to create the opportunities to raise it back again to 400,000. Because it makes no sense to me, brothers and sisters, it makes no sense to me that we have so many people unemployed and we have so little direction as to how we're going to put people to work. Let me tell you, let me, let, let me tell you some of the things that frustrate me and, and really keep things in focus. I was in Fort McMurray mm, two weeks ago, I think. Anyway, we walked around the workplace and we spent a fair bit of time meeting people. And I was surprised at the amount of our members in Fort McMurray for, from the East Coast. And I spoke to them. And they left because their industry, their community, their way of living, their family way of living was getting decimated. And I suggest to you that it's an absolute crime when 
We have such a strong fishing industry, or it should be stronger, and we catch our fish, and we ship our fish to China for processing while we're closing fish processing plants here in Canada. So young people are leaving their families and their communities and going many provinces over to make a living, to send money back or to stabilize their futures. And there's something inherently wrong with that type of a system where we can't even create good paying jobs in our communities that have been there for generations. And that's what we're dealing with. Why? Because we don't have any strategy in the fishery sector. We don't have any strategy for the forestry sector. We don't have any uh, strategy for the energy sector. Think about the debate that's going on across Canada. Think about the debates of pipelines. We have the Keystone Pipeline that goes from Fort McMurray to Texas that shipped 18,000 jobs down the pipeline. And what are we talking about today? We're talking about a Keystone XL pipeline that'll ship another 25,000 jobs down the pipeline. We're talking about a Kinder Morgan pipeline from Fort McMurray to Kitimat, BC, which will ship the bitumen right through a pipe, loading them on huge, huge vessels to ship our bitumen to China, California, different places for refining. We're looking at pipelines. We have closed. 10 refineries in Canada, 10, 10, yet we're talking about building pipelines to offshore our jobs. Can somebody explain to me why, once you resolve the environmental issues, you resolve the Aboriginal issues, that we can't have a pipeline that'll go to a Canadian refinery to put people to work? And while we're at it, if we're going to have... If we're going to have an industry that's going to be sustainable, can you explain to me why we can't have large motors made by General Electric in Peterborough that employ our members and make sure that the infrastructure that supports that type of development is done by Canadians? What is wrong with that? We just don't even think about it. We're going to be in health care bargaining coming up. At the same time as the debate on the health care accord, and we all know what the debate's going to be. We're going to go into bargaining, and we're talking about wages and benefits for our members. And the same time the debate on the health care accord will be going on across the country, where we talk about, and the right will try to argue that we just can't afford it anymore. So the debate of what Unifor is going to be front and center is going to be about how we are going to make sure that future generations are going to enjoy the same opportunities we did as it relates to universal health care. So that's what we're going to be doing as an organization. So we're going to use every opportunity of collective bargaining to talk about a better vision for Canada. And let me tell you something, we're doing it already. And we're out there and we're talking about this vision. And people are listening. And we are getting people's attention. And as you can imagine, I'm spending a lot of time meeting with a lot of politicians across the country. I met with Justin Trudeau a few weeks ago. I didn't like him much right off the bat because he's tall. And that, I found that frustrating, and I told him that. <laughs> but we had a hell of a debate. And we talked about the Keystone Pipeline because he's in favor of the Keystone Pipeline. And I said to him, I'm not, I don't have a problem with pipelines. I have a problem that they don't end up in a Canadian refiner. We had one heck of a debate about it. But I said to him, and you need to know this, I said to him, you had one heck of a commercial on television where you talked about the middle class. I said, that was a very good commercial. Full marks, because somebody needs to talk about the working class. But anybody that talks about working class people, I think that's a heck of a first step because nobody's doing that in Canada. But I said to him, there's one thing about having these commercials and going around the country and talking about the middle class, but when you have an opportunity to do something about it and stand up and fight for working class people in the house, you don't say anything. I said, we've got in Ottawa right now three bills C4, 525, 377, you haven't said a damn thing about it. Nothing. He said to me, he says, Jerry, I try not to get caught up in the minutia of the house. <laughs> uh, the conversation didn't go very well after that comment. And I'm saying that because we have to fight tooth and nail for everything we have. 
And we need to change the focus of the discussion in Canada, and I believe that is happening. And we will never organize new members to our union unless we organize the ones we've got. And I want you to think about this. And I want you to be, and I want you to be candid with yourselves. We have a lot of new members in our workplaces. We have a lot of members that have been in our workplace for years that really don't understand why it is they receive the wages, the bench pensions, the benefits that they receive. They think that the employer gave it to them. Don't understand the struggles, the amount of work it took from the leadership, us and people before us, to build a collective agreement. And that's our fault that they don't know. So we need to spend more time talking to people. And I want you to know, think about this. Because I know a lot of you are sitting there and you're thinking, hold on, that's, that's easier said than done. Because we have members that are in different shifts, they're transient, they, they work in vehicles, they leave the, the, the workplace at the beginning of the day and come back at the end, so it's tough to get them together. It's tough to bring people to participate in membership meetings. So there's all of those reasons that we can use to justify how difficult it is to speak to our members. But the fact of the matter is, couldn't you imagine if the far right in this country had their way and they eliminated the RAND formula or they started to strike down some of the laws that we have in Nova Scotia where we can write in, dues check off in the collective agreement? If you think it's difficult talking to your members now, think about how difficult it will be walking around the workplace with a cap in your hand to collect your dues. All right? So think about that when we're starting to think of how difficult it is to speak to our members. So we are speaking not only to the Justin Trudeaus of the world, we're speaking to a lot of conservatives, I'm speaking to premiers, I'm speaking to governments right across the country. The facts are we're making a difference. I'm convinced the changes to 525 and 377, I'm convinced, matter of fact, I know a lot of this is happening because we're out there. We're challenging, we're leading, we're doing all those things we committed to each other, we are all going to do back Labor Day weekend in Toronto. But well, we got a long way to go because we need to make sure that we've got our backyard taken care of. We need to make sure that we're engaged politically. We need to make sure that at the end of the day in Ontario, Hudak and his ideals are wiped out. And here's why it's so important. And Jordan raised it in his presentation. If we are successful in Ontario, and right now Stephen Harper is at the lowest he's been in personal popularity since he was elected Prime Minister. Think about what happens in 2015 if Harper doesn't win a majority. If Hudak loses, he's gone. If Harper doesn't have a majority, he's gone. And think about what that means for working people across the country. So. The stakes are very high. And I want you to think about this for a moment. There is nobody in Canada that believes that Stephen Harper didn't know about the $90,000 payment from Nigel Wright to Duffy. <laughs> the most controlling politician in the history of Canadian politics knew nothing about it. Give me a break. Remember the robocalls? The elimination of the Canadian census, the reduction of the Canadian stats, cutbacks to the CBC. I can start to walk through them all. It's all about frustrating the voices of dissent. Well, one thing that is for sure, they are never, ever going to frustrate our voice of dissent. So we are out there. And we need to make sure that we do this as a united front. So I'm asking you, I'm asking you, when we get you the information, get it into your workplaces. Speak to your members. Speak to your neighbors. Participate in your community. Build a stronger community. Because I know that together we can do this. This is the most important campaign you will ever participate in. This is about the future of our movement. This is about the future of opportunities for young people. And this is about 
paying respect to our members that have lost their jobs over the years. We have to fight to make sure they get back in the workplace where there's good, well-paying jobs. Brothers and sisters, this is up to all of us. Thank you very much. I know we can do this.